Hey, been collecting up a few um, bits and pieces here, and I've started a bit of a collection of these uh, Tetronix TM500 modules. And there's a whole range of these things, which all do different functions and that. And um, I start off uh, grabbing a few items that will let me calibrate uh, scopes, uh, oscilloscopes, the old Tetronix oscilloscopes. And then um, kind of went from there, and I've been seeing a few of them pop up recently. Um, I think people are starting to offload their equipment uh, because of coronavirus, and they, you know, aren't getting as much work as normal and they uh, getting rid of some gear that they don't use so I've been picking up a few of these things pretty cheap and um, I've got a few of these so um, in the coming months and maybe a bit longer um, we might start just going through and uh, having a look at each one of these modules as I collect them and the, the ones I've got and um, restoring them and whatnot um, but for st starters we've got this one here which is a DC503A a universal counter timer so it's basically just a, um, a frequency counter and it does timing and stuff. You can compare between the two inputs and uh, do periods and width and frequency and a few other bits and pieces like that. But um, yeah, they're basically just a, a, a module that plugs into a, a mainframe. This one's a, a TM502A, so TM50X, that means it's a 500 series. The two means it's a two bays. You can see the, the two sections there. And the A just means it's got a, a rear power switch. If there's no A, it's a little bit wider, I believe, and it's got like a, a power switch on the side there. I've got um, the 502, I've got a 501, I've got two 501s, which we'll be restoring um, soon. And I've got a, a 5006, uh, that's a 5000 series, just a newer series, it's all compatible. But um, yeah, so I've got a few um, of these, uh, these chassis, and um, I've got a bunch... Well, here's another one here. This one is a FG502 function generator. It's like a few megahertz function generator. See, it's got the same plug on the back. Plugs in and um, gives you outputs and you can dial what you want. And Yeah, they, you can just basically make your own uh, test rig. Just plug in the modules in whatever order you want, whichever modules you want. If you finish one test, you've got to do another test. You can unplug a module and plug a new one in. Um, you can even make your own modules. This one here's a blank one. It's got a uh, like perf board sort of prototyping board with the uh, some pads here for uh, the power supply section. Like it's all the uh, like input voltages and stuff on these uh, pads here. You can just jump across, almost like a old school plug-in breadboard prototype board module. And you can yeah make your own. They come in a double width as well. But yeah, so this came with uh, one of the kits that I bought. Uh, someone was selling um, uh, this two-way uh, box with that module and another module in it, so yeah, it was just, I don't know if I'm going to use it, because it seems, it seems somehow special in a way, I don't know, like, I don't feel like I want to use it, because it's like, I can never use it again, you know, but I might, I'm almost thinking I might see how easy it is to convince one of those Chinese uh, uh, PCB manufacturers to make some of these, there's a lot of holes, and they kind of get a bit grumpy when there's so many holes to drill, because it slows down their process, but yeah, it would be interesting to see if I can make a few of these boards because I can just like slot them in and yeah, if I if I make one thing, I'm not wasting it. If I ever want to change it, I don't have to desolder everything. I just put a new PCB in and I've got into the the one chassis. But that's rambling on a, the different subject. What we're talking about today is the DC 503A Universal Counter and Timer. So um, you normally will. Uh, not turn it on, but we'll take it apart. But this time I'm going to plug it in just so we can see how it works and then we're going to take it apart because looking in here it looks like there's something a bit funny usually these come um, with just a normal uh, crystal but if you get option zero one or option one they've got a oven controlled crystal oscillator which is a big silver can you can see it where this foam thing is um, it's usually a big silver can but this has got something different which has got me curious I'm wondering if someone's had a bit of a play and done something custom in there. We'll plug it in, turn it on, see if it works, and um, then we'll uh, open it up and have a closer look. So these just plug in, make sure you turn the unit off. I'll unplug it actually just to make sure. <laughs> I don't want to blow it up on camera, as uh, interesting of a video that would make. But you just push it in, plug it in, it's done. To pull it out, you've got the little tab down the bottom here and you pull it, and then it kind of just ugh, comes out like that. Real easy. So I'll plug that in. Give it some power. 
And if we turn it on the back, you can see, oh yeah, it's working. So I've got my um, my function generator set up with the uh, through the uh, BNC, set to 10 megahertz. Plug that in. Aha, there we go. I um, had the level turned to the wrong. You got to turn up and down until you get a reading. So I got 10 megahertz. That's reading 9.99999, basically bouncing on 10. As that internal oscillator warms up, oops, it'll um, hopefully come up a bit more uh, accurately. But that's pretty close. So that is working. 10 megahertz, and we've got it on. Uh, let's have a look. Microsecond slash megahertz. There, I've got this set to frequency. So we're looking at megahertz. That's reading 10 megahertz. So that's good. That rules out any uh, troubleshooting we have to do which probably would make for a slightly more interesting video but no big no big deal what I'll do is I'll pull this out ah because I want to look at that what's going on with that oscillator in there that crystal oscillator I'll get rid of the uh, chassis and let's open it up so we've got both sides we can open up Pretty easy to work on, just a little turny thing. Some of them, the sides just kind of like are clipped in. There's no screw, you just kind of carefully lift it out and unclips. Don't want to um, be too rough on it because you can bend the side, but um, this one is just two little plastic turny things. And we are in, as they say, like Flynn. So before we turn it back over, we have got one of the circuit boards. There's two in here, I believe. Yes, two. So we got our input fuses here. Uh, we got LSI, Large Scale Integration. That's a brand name, isn't it? LSI. Uh, it looks like an old chip anyway. Um, I'm glad that's that's not faulty. I've got a voltage regulator, 7812. That's a, a 12 volt voltage regulator. Not too many electrolyte caps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, at this stage, it's working, so I probably won't bother replacing them. We've got a crystal there. What's that? Doesn't say what. To, oh yeah, there it is. Ten megahertz. So that that's probably our standard um, crystal. And it looks like, yeah. So there's a little jumper. Just there. And you can set it to internal and external. So if you put it on internal, it uses the internal oscillator. If you put it on external, it takes the uh, the 10 megahertz reference from here. So you can have an external one plug it into the back like an option sort of connector on the back of your chassis and then feed your own 10 megahertz uh, signal in. But this has been actually disconnected entirely. So what it seems is happening is that this little oscillator, the standard one, um, is not being used because it says on the manual here on the uh, schematic where is it it says there's the uh, just there is the um, the jumper external comes out to the back panel internal comes into here and it says standard time based components removed when option one time base in is installed so there's a whole bunch of components here which are removed and then the option one time base is put in there with a uh, a regulator and basically just a voltage regulator straight into the um, the OCXO, the oven controlled crystal oscillator. So it's a basic linear voltage regulator. And it says here 18 volts, but I have actually found the, um, I'll turn it over and I'll show you. I've actually found the data sheet for this one and it's 12 volts. So this here is using a variable voltage regulator. You can see there's two resistors, a divider. You just alter those resistors and you can dial in any voltage you want. So I can use this same exact circuit, I'll just put two different resistors there to get 12 volts. So here, you can see what he's done. So we've got a uh, OCXO, the Oven Controlled Crystal Oscillator, OCXO, O, Oven, C, Controlled, X for Crystal, O, Oscillator, OCXO. Sitting in there, it is powered from one of these eBay sort of little, I guess that's going to be a buck converter uh, it's going to be dropping the voltage down from the input because the input voltages are generally high um, higher than 12 volts because then you regulate it down to what you need in the circuit so they provide you more than what you need and you can make that down to whatever you need inside 
So that's what that's going to be doing. He's got like a, a choke there. Looks like a, that's just a normal choke. Little capacitor. Um, that's tied into the voltage. Oh, where's it coming around? To here somewhere. I think that's from the, um, that's tied there. That's going to be like the 18 volts or something. So he's bringing it down to 12 volts. Comes around into here. So let's take that out and see what we've got exactly. Because I think by not connecting that jumper to the internal or the external, he's disconnected everything and then he's uh, jumpered it in with this one. So let's turn it over. I've got a protection diode there, looks like. Or is that a tantalum capacitor? I'm not sure. Maybe that's... Yeah, it's a bit ambiguous. 22-25. It might be a 22 microfarad 25 volt tantalum, maybe. That would make more sense than the diode being reverse bias because uh, you don't really need the protection if you've hardwired it yourself. Anyway, there's a common mode choke there as well to stop noise. I probably would have put that on the output of the power supply because if you allow the noise to get to here before you block it, you've got two antennas running all the way here. They are twisted, so there's a little bit of common mode um, rejection there. Or like not common mode rejection, um, cancellation. Uh, and that is got the output coming from here. Zoop, into there. And he's tied that in over here. So yeah, it looks like that's what he's done. He's um, disconnected the internal oscillator and junk, uh, jumped this one in. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look into making this more an accurate 0, 1 or option 1 system. Oh, get rid of that. And I'm going to wire this directly into the pads because I don't know if you can see there. I'll try and uh, point this out. The um, If you get the option, it sits in this gap here. You can see there's like a cutout in the top board. And we've got one, two, three, and four pads. Oop. And they're the pads of the, uh, the oscillator, the oven control oscillator, oscillator connects to. One, two, three three and four. So I want to connect this directly to that and then install that linear voltage regulator with the resistors set correctly for 12 volts for this. And I'll um, I'll probably leave this on a little board. I might even get one made up. I've got to make some, uh, make a PCB order from JLC or Seed or something. So I might make a little circuit board for that to, sit on, to replace this one just so it's nice and neat and um, a bit nicer than this kind of this one's just been hand cut from single side uh, blank PCB. I can see he's written 12 volt there. So that's what he's feeding in. He's like scratched into the copper. So I'm going to remove this. And I'll trace out this. And uh, see what I can find in here. To, um, to make this work. All right, so I've got all this junk removed. The old uh, circuit board and eBay power supply, that's going to go in the parts bin, or the power supply at least. Uh, and uh, I've desoldered the um, oven-controlled crystal oscillator, but it turns out I've got its big brother. Mm -mm. We've got a 9130C here, and I've already got a uh, 9140A. I pulled that out of a um, some CDMA phone test equipment that's completely obsolete, uh, stripped it down for parts and I got that, 10 megahertz a crystal oscillator and being it's big brother uh, I think it might be better because bigger is always better. So I've got the uh, data sheets and let's compare them so we can see uh, what we got. So there's a 9130C on this side and that's 9140A on this side. So we've got um, short term stability on the 9130C is 1 times 10 to the minus 9, and it's 1 times 10 to the minus 10 on uh, the 9140, so that's better. After 24 hours operation, um, it says here, 2 times 10 to the minus 8 on the 9130, on the 9140, 1 times 10 to the minus 9, so that's better as well. And after one year, so that was after one day of operation, after one uh, year, 
minus 2 times 10 to the minus 7 and minus 3 times 10 to the minus 8. That's the aging. That's like how it drifts over time. Uh, so yeah, it's all betterer for the biggerer. So I'm going to use that. That can go in this parts bin for something else. And this, I think I'm going to install into here. Now, I've got to make sure it's not taller than that. So, if I stick that there, and put that on top. Yeah, we've got enough room. I'll use some really short standoffs. And have that just below, so it's just missing the lid. I don't want to push up against it. I'll just have it like a millimetre or two underneath. And that should be fine. So, in the schematic, I had a, another bit of a look here, and it's we've got to pull out all of this part, this stuff here, the old oscillator section. Um, I thought maybe I could jig it up in a certain way that I could leave it in there and just disconnect somehow, because I don't know if you can see that there. Our uh, oven control oscillator, it's just got a power supply, and that's it. That's what that that is there, as I said before. Through the oscillator, and comes out, and then into the circuit through the jumper one external internal but the internal uh, standard one there's nothing I can really take out unless I remove a transistor and a resistor um, at that point I maybe I should just may as well take all the rest out just so it's not in the way not uh, drawing any power not using any like quiescent current or anything so I might just go and pull it all out I can't easily just isolate it without cutting tracks and stuff um, so yeah then I'll um, make that circuit board and uh, put uh, this one in. So I'm going to figure out exactly what parts I need to remove. It's going to be all in around this area here. So this crystal, this variable capacitor, or this trimmer capacitor, some of these capacitors here maybe. There's no solder mask. Oh, sorry, solder mask. There's solder mask. There's no silk screen because it's an older PCB. Often they they went away with the um. Did away with the uh, the uh, silk screen just because easier to manufacture at the time. So I'm going to print out, see if there is, and if there is, I'm going to print out the uh, board layout from the manual, and then I can use that to pinpoint exactly what I'm going to remove. We got it in. It's looking pretty good, right there. Look at that. Got some uh, boards made up at JLC PCB. Had to make five of them because I only make a minimum of five, but that's all right. They're cheap as anything anyway. So um, I've got a few spares if, if I get this uh, same setup in the future. Um, I'll make this file available if you want it. Um, if you happen to have a uh, NDK 9140A series crystal oscillator to go into the uh, DC503A, uh, yeah, you can get some of these made up, but it's a bit of a specific niche application. But anyway... I'll make those available anyway. Um, so the way I mounted this thing is I, uh, you see the holes there? I just uh, countersunk those holes and uh, put some countersunk screws in. Just use a drill bit or a countersinking tool. Uh, that way it sits flush, the screws, because this sits almost flush to the circuit board. It's got some little standoffs, so it sits up about one or two mil. But um, yeah, I can't have like a, a normal screw doming up because it, it won't fit. So uh, some countersunk screws there. Then I put the um, some spacers. See if I can get the right angle here. Oh, yeah, there you go, you can see the spacer in there. There's two of those. Just a few millimetres, like three millimetre or four millimetre or something, I think they are. And then we've got our two screws on the back holding it in. Just uh, there and there. And then uh, to make the connection, you can see the, uh, the four holes along here. They just uh, drop straight through to the circuit board, just above, where are we? There we go, just above there, above the screws. And um, I use, just use some tin copper wire. Then before I, uh, I put the crystal oscillator on, I put the, the wires in, put the screws in and the standoffs to hold it nice and secure, soldered those, cut them flush, the, um, the solder joints, I cut them flush on this side, and then put some capped on tape on the top. Uh, that's just going to make sure that there's no shorts are possible to the uh, case of the, uh, the oscillator, just to give it an extra layer of protection. That's then screwed in there. And uh, on this side, I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, this way, oh, that'll do it. So uh, I've removed all the old uh, 10 megahertz reference, um, the oscillator there, the uh, standard non-temperature compensator one. Got all the parts here. So um, I'll probably keep some of these parts. The resistors I don't really care about, but the oscillator is good. Uh, or the crystal, sorry. Uh, that's a 10 megahertz, so that's a nice round number. We've got a, uh, a trimmer capacitor, which is handy. And uh, these dog bone capacitors, I like keeping these because they're good for um, 
period accurate repairs. I actually need one of these. It's uh, 12 picofarad, so I'm not sure if any of these are. There's a color numbers on there, but I'm, or the color code on there for the numbers, but I'm going to um, just measure them because, eh, it's easy just to measure it than to figure out those codes. So, um, that's for another project though. So, um, that's all been removed. So, in, in the place of all this stuff, we've got the uh, power supply, the 12 volt power supply for the, uh, the new oven control crystal oscillator. So, we've got a LM317T, a TO220 part there. That's been screwed down to the uh, case. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, then we've got the blue capacitor here is a 0.1 microfarad on the input side. That's uh, correct as per the uh, the schematics, the tex Tektronix schematics and the data sheet. I've gone a little bit different to the Tektronix uh, uh, schematics with this one here. This yellow one is a tantalum capacitor. Uh, I've gone for one microfarad because in the ma in the uh, data sheet for the LM317, it says you can use a one microfarad tantalum or I believe a 25 microfarad electrolytic. And um, I went for the tantalum because it's small and compact. 50 volt part in there. And um, yeah, that's going to be fine. Uh, tantalums are very sensitive to over voltage, but for a 12 volt regulator, the input voltage is 33 volts. So even if the regulator blows or p starts passing the full voltage, that's rated at 50 volts. We won't get any little fires going on in there at all. Um, so I did that just for the better ripple, um, ripple rejection and the uh, better um, output specs for our uh, voltage to the, uh, the crystal oscillator. So um, Tektronix specify 0.1 microfarad ceramic. I've gone for the tantalum. Went for the data sheet because it seems a bit, a bit safer. But either raw is probably going to be pr pretty all right. Uh, these two blue resistors just in between the tantalum and the uh, the regulator. That's what sets the voltage. So I've set it to just above 12 volts because with the standard 1% re uh, resistor values, I couldn't get exactly 12 volts. I could get slightly above or slightly below, and I thought slightly above is a bit better. Bit of headroom, and um, the oscillator is fine with that. And then one last bit here, which I've added myself. This capacitor is a 10 microfarad electrolytic. According to the data sheet for the LM317, uh, a 10 microfarad uh, electrolytic between the ground and then in between the two um, uh, voltage divider resistors, those two blue resistors, uh, if you connect up a 10 microfarad capacitor, it just improves the output ripple. Uh, to a lower value so it just gives you a cleaner output and it's easy enough to stick in there just onto those uh, resistors and um, yeah I had a spare uh, capacitor so I just stuck it in just for a better and smoother output uh, it probably doesn't make much of a difference in this application but uh, it's not going to hurt so coming back to the uh, the regulator there you got to be careful um, this tab on the top isn't connected to the ground uh, some voltage regulators that tab is at ground potential, some it isn't. This one it isn't, it's on the output potential, on the output pin. So if you can just screw that straight down to the case, it's going to short out and you're going to have like no output and it's going to give you problems. So uh, the way the Tektronix did it before uh, in the uh, the old, you know, the, the standard setup, they would have a the sill pad like what I've got here, that white one there, and they would put a polycarbonate screw. It appeared to be a polycarbonate, not a nylon. And the difference is that a nylon is softer and not quite as strong. And you can tell the difference because a nylon is a like a milky white color or a black color. Whereas polycarbonate is almost always uh, crystal clear. Like almost looks like glass. It's not glass, it's just the polycarbonate plastic. But they're a little bit stronger. But the problem with using plastic screws is they cannot get the correct mounting force to uh, make a good thermal connection. Uh, you, for a TO220, you need between about 12 and 15, maybe up to 17. Beyond 17, you're not going to get any... Uh, any better uh, connection uh, so 12 newton meters to 15 newton meters um, but a nylon screw for example will break at about 3 to 4 newton meters for an M3 screw uh, you're not going to get nearly enough uh, clamping force to get a proper thermal interface and a polycarbonate might be a little bit more but not that much so I've gone through for a metal screw there and to stop it from uh, shorting you can't really see it's very hard to see even on an angle but there's a a nylon kind of top hat washer that's inside there uh, it's like a top hat shape that's designed for TO220 packages and it provides that insulation so that that screw isn't actually touching the tab at all. But because it's a metal screw, we can force it down to the uh, 12 newton means we need. Now, to um, to figure out how to um, give yourself enough um, force, to give the uh, TO220 en enough force, I've calibrated my fingers. I test. I do have a, 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 a torque screwdriver. I set it to 12, about 12 to 15 newton meters. And I figured out that if you put your screw in the screw, uh, the screwdriver into the screw, and you tighten as tight as you can with two fingers, not crazy tight, like don't go Hulk mode, but nice and firm, 
two fingers that'll get you a pretty much ballpark for the um, thermal interface that will get you about 12 to 15 Newton meters just like that twisting with two fingers that'll be about right for a TO220 so that is all done we've got our power supply working we've got the uh, oscillator installed and um, we're ready to go one last thing before I forget now there's two jumpers here. One is labeled internal and external. Of course, you need it on internal. If you put it to external, you're going to be taking the 10 megahertz reference from the uh, the back plane, which you don't want unless you want to be using an external input. But if you do that, there's no point to use the um, to use the crystal oscillator, the um, oven control crystal oscillator. But so we want that um, connected to internal. And there's this other jumper just here, and it's labeled TTL on one side, on the right hand side, and on the other left hand side there's no label. Now, depending on which crystal oscillator you use, if it has a TTL, out, TTL output, you want it on the right hand side. If it doesn't, you want it on the, on the left. Um, the old crystal oscillator that, I, that was in here, this one here, it was working on the TTL. Uh, when I put the new one in, it didn't work, so I just switched it across and then it worked. Like The, the system worked. So, a little bit of trial and error, just try which one works. If it doesn't work, flick it over to the other side and then um, yeah, see which one works the best. So let's uh, put the covers on this, stick it in the, uh, in the power enclosure and uh, see what happens if we let the smoke out. Alright, we've got the uh, module in the box. Function generator is connected. I'm going a cappella style here with the, uh, the phone camera just so I get the right angles. So um, let's turn on, see what happens. Looking pretty good. No smoke coming out. What's going on in here? Nothing's wrong in there. No smoke. That's good. Nothing out the top. I think we're looking pretty good. Hit the button. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Let's turn the function generator on and see what we get. Oh yeah, nice. That is awesome. Thumbs up, bit of a squeeze. I think we're done. We got it working. So that is how you install Option 01 Oven Control Crystal Oscillator into your Tektronix DC503A. Thumbs up. We'll see you next time.